David, this isn't Don. Hear me right? And the correct answer, <laughs> what is Joseph? <laughs> correct question. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Welcome. And to all of our viewers at home, it's a nice group tonight. <laughs> oh, you're going, she's going to get Larry. Larry's lighting candles, so. Larry! <laughs> there he is he's coming in the other way it's like a benny hill sketch harriet he's here he's here can you do that one oh the benny hill, benny hill. <laughs> that's that's a little beyond me that's a little that's you need the music for that one shabbat shalom everybody once again thank you for being with us tonight we're going to hear uh, two different perspectives on a very important. Sometimes they get really quiet for me right away, and sometimes they don't. <laughs> All righty then. <laughs> As we were saying, uh, we're here tonight to, uh, to celebrate Shabbat, of course, but also we have the, uh, the privilege of listening to uh, two different perspectives on a very important issue, the war in Ukraine, and we will hear from Renee Lichtman and from Dr. Fred Pearson in just a few moments. A couple of reminders, there is no Shabbat service next Friday night, because we'll all be filled with matzah, and hopefully uh, not to our detriment, <laughs> enjoying some time at home. But we will be together on Thursday night. For those of you who have not yet made reservations and are still interested in attending our Seder, it begins at 6 o'clock. And I know there's a little bit of space left, not a ton. And you can join us. Uh, you can call on Monday. Uh, I think the online sales are closed already. But you can call on Monday, and we should be able to make space for you. Uh, but please don't delay too much if you're intending to, uh, to attend. Uh, and then I cannot remember what the program is when we next come because usually Michelle leaves me a cheat sheet and I have completely forgotten. It is not Pam Anderson that I don't believe. Who is? It's Jer Senator Jeremy Moss. Thank you for knowing yeah. this better than I. He will be here to speak on uh, Friday night, the whatever it is, the 15th, I guess. Uh, so at any rate, uh, we're going to hear tonight. Uh, or from our participants, Dr. Mark Luria, Lorraine, Lonnie Fleischer, if she's here, I hope she is. If not, we'll have a sub. Uh, Rick Grauer is here, and Jean Clarich and Ruth Kadish. And we will begin with the first reading, Arthur, if you will. The reading before we light candles. A poem by a very famous Hebrew poet named simply Zelda, the poet. To light candles everywhere, that is Shabbat. To light Shabbat candles is a leap of our spirits, pregnant with potential, to a splendid sea where we can contemplate the mystery of the fire of sunset. Lighting the candles transforms our space into that legendary river of fire where our hearts set 
Emerald Waterfall. I'd like to invite Harriet Meza, Harry Ellen Bogan to light our candles. So the candles are over there. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Tonight, as we welcome Shabbat, we look to this moment in time to once again gain perspective on where we have been and where we are going. In this Shabbat, may we find the space to consider and to challenge. May we find the courage to do what is right. Together, let us find meaning, calm our anxieties, understand our purpose, and appreciate our accomplishments. Let us find the strength to continue working for ourselves and others. Let us share the burdens and blessings of responsibility. Let us locate the will to change the things we can no longer accept. Let us do all of this and more, mindful that we are a community of humanistic Jew Jewish believers, unbroken and unbowed, prepared to face all that life has in store for us. Let us strive to feel these bonds of <coughs> belief and community where we are together and when we are apart. Let us rejoice in our tithes. Let us rejoice in our collective power. Let us rejoice in the gift of Shabbat. Last minute substitute, Shabbat Shalom. As with our forebears, we affirm that righteousness and enlightenment shall be our torch. We shall teach these values diligently to our children and grandchildren. All the days of our lives, we shall endeavor to live by these values in the comfort of our homes or on cold and windswept roads. Whether adversity bows our heads or fulfillment makes our spirits soar, our hands shall meet out justice to all, and our eyes shall be open to the light of truth. We shall emblazon our paths through life with this light as a beacon for all humanity. Tikva 
Let us strive to lead loving, passionate lives, our hearts, our wisdom, with our actions. These words we inscribe in our innermost being, aspiring to practice them day and night, teaching them diligently to our children, to our words, especially to our deeds, so that the next generations may learn to revere, celebrate, Robert Ingersoll, one of the towering humanists of the 19th century, wrote, If abuses are destroyed, we must destroy them. If slaves are freed, we must free them. If new truths are discovered, we must discover them. If the naked are clothed, the hungry are fed. If justice is done, if labor is rewarded, if superstition is driven from the mind, if the defenseless are protected, and if right finally triumphs, all must be the work of our <coughs> hands. The grand victories of the future must be won by us and by us alone. Ben-Chorin 
לא עליך המלאכה לגמור, לא עליך לגמור, לא עליך המלאכה לגמור, לא עליך לגמור. On February 14th, 1990, the first deep space probe Voyager 1 left our planetary neighborhood for the fringes of the solar system. Engineers turned it around. One last look. Home planet, now four billion miles away. The picture, although it was artificially enhanced, to show you where we are. Carl Sagan wrote, look at that dot. That's here. That's home. That's us. On it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you ever heard of, every human being who ever was, lived out their lives. The Earth is a very small stage in a vast cosmic arena. Think of the endless cruelties visited by the inhabitants of one corner of this pixel on the scarcely distinguishable inhabitants of some other corner. How frequent their misunderstandings. How eager they are to kill one another. How fervent their hatred. Think of the rivers of blood spilled by all those generals and emperors so that glory and triumph could become the momentary masters of a fraction of a dot. Our posturings, our imagined self-importance, the delusion that we have some privileged position in the universe are challenged by this point, pale light. Our planet is a lonely speck in the great enveloping cosmic dark. In our obscurity and all this vastness, there is no hint help will come from elsewhere, save us from ourselves. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another, preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. In this community where we find strength and common purpose, we turn our minds and hearts toward all those who need our love, support, those who are ill, those who suffer pain of the body or spirit, those who are lonely, who have been wronged. Tonight, our well wishes are extended to these members of our community and to their loved ones. Roy Chestnut, Natan Fuchs, Ruthie Goldman, Ruth Moltz, Suzanne Paul, Rabbi Peter Schweitzer, and Jim Walker. If there's someone whom you're thinking about, we'll start on this side of the room if there's any name. Anyone else over here? May all who suffer know that they are not alone, that we are there. May they be healed quickly. May they experience a rufu ashlema, complete recovery. Renewal of their bodies and the renewal of their spirit. Mm. 
May the source of strength that dwells so deep within us help us find the courage to make our lives a blessing and let us say Shalom. Mekom ha-koach betocheinu mekorota May those in need of healing know refuah lema, the renewal of body, the renewal of spirit, and let us say, Shalom. In memoriam, if I should die and leave you here a while, be not like others sore undone, who keep long vigil by the silent dust. For my sake, turn again to life and smile, serving thy heart and trembling hand, something to comfort other hearts than mine. Complete these dear, unfinished tasks of mine, and I perchance may therein comfort you. Our thoughts turn to those who are no longer with us, our own loved ones, those whom our friends and neighbors have lost, the martyrs of our people whose graves are unmarked, and those of every people and nation whose lives have been a blessing to humanity. As we remember them, we meditate on the meaning of love and loss, of life and death. Recall now our loved ones whom death has recently taken from us, those who died at this season in years past, those whom we have taken into our hearts with our own. Tonight, we observe the yard sites of the members and their loved ones, Dorothy G. Brower, Esther Luria, Albert Paul, Carol Schiff, James Walker, Leon Williams, Irene Young. If there's someone whom you're thinking about whose name you'd like to add to the list, once again, we're on the room. Memories of these beloved people bring a spark of blessing to our lives as we face them. If you can do so comfortably, please rise. Together we recite our humanistic interpretation of Kaddish. Together, Nit Gadal Venit Kaddash Beruach Adam. Let us dignify and ennoble all people, spirit of our shared humanity. Let us acclaim the preciousness of life. Let us show gratitude for life by approaching it with reverence. Let us embrace the whole world, even as we wrestle with its parts. Let us each in our own way take up our share in serving the world and seeking truth. May our commitment to life help us to strengthen healing of spirit, peace of mind. May justice and peace permeate and comfort the house of Israel and all those who dwell on earth, and let us say, Ben Yehi, may it be so. Please be seated. So I've already told you our speakers tonight are, and I will introduce them in a moment, actually one by one before they speak. Uh, but what I'll, uh, what we'll be doing tonight, the time is around 7:25, almost 7:30. Each of our speakers will speak for 15, 20 minutes or so, uh, present their point of view. And then after that, we'll entertain questions, and hopefully uh, they'll have a chance to answer each other in that format as well. We're going to begin with uh, Renee Lechtman, who uh, actually initiated this, uh, this program this evening. Uh, Renee Lichtman was born in Paris, France in 1937 to Polish Jewish parents. His father joined the French army and was killed in combat in 1940 against the invading Germans. Rene and his mother survived the war in hiding in France in different locations. Rene was hidden with a Catholic family for the entire war. His mother, 
able to hide in Paris with the help of neighbors. They reunited after the war. Rene came to the U.S. in 1950 with his mother. He was 13, spoke no English, but loved to draw and was recognized by teachers. He graduated from the Cooper Union Art School, Art School and has been the recipient of a Fulbright scholarship in painting. Rene has been a filmmaker of documentaries on auto workers and on Jewish children in Poland during the Second World War. He holds degrees in fine arts, mass communication, and a PhD, his doctorate in instructional technology from Wayne State University, Detroit, Michigan. As an artist, he continues to paint and has had solo exhibits in Michigan. The Holocaust child survivor, Rene speaks regularly at schools, community groups, churches, synagogues, of course, he's spoken here, and the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Farmington Hills. Renee, come on up, please. Thank you, Shabbat Shalom. So, subject is um, Russia, Ukraine, NATO, and USA. Uh, I can't separate those, and I'll be speaking about both of them. Also, have to speak about NATO expansion. Want me to get closer? Right. Please, tell me if, in the back if you have problems, you know. Can't, really? Oh, oh, no. Okay. Is that better? Okay, that's very, very close. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm talking about um, Russia, uh, Ukraine, NATO, and the USA. Also, the NATO expansion, which is my major theme, I think what's, what's occurred as a result of NATO expansion. I'll also talk about provocations for the last 30 or 40 years by the West against um, Russia, and I'll document that. Uh, the idea of a regime change by the neocons, the neoconservatives are back. Um, what's called national interest, that's part of the discussion, and also the proxy war that's going on, which is really a war between Russia and the United States. My thesis, to cut to the chase, is that the United States, and particularly Biden, are war criminals uh, in a long line of uh, war criminals going back to uh, the Vietnam War, Iraq, Afghanistan, where we've in initiated, or the neocons have initiated all these, um, all these wars. You can't, you, um, oh my goodness, now I have to move back, okay. Um, okay, I was told to go closer. I need. All right, okay. Uh, I mentioned the date 1945 because I think a, a lot of the, that's the larger context uh, that it would help us understand what's going on today. In 1945, the Americans were um, uh, questioning Nazi uh, officials, and uh, that was the old CIA, uh, or the present CIA, which was the OSS back then. And the Nazi uh, official said to the American, he says, he says, why, why are you uh, questioning me? I'm, um, uh, you know, I'm not the enemy. Why don't we just get together and keep going east? He said, that was the idea. I thought we were going to get together, the Americans and the Germans, and keep going east. That was the, that was the context even back then in terms of the, the way the West used, showed, uh, uh, saw the uh, uh, Russia. Slide, please. This is 1960. Uh, it shows the map of, uh, can we have, please. Uh, so that's the line of uh, uh, demarc the demarcation between the NATO forces in the uh, West and uh, what was known then in, uh, as the Warsaw Pact countries. These are both military alliances. NATO is a military alliances. You know, they have guided missiles and uh, nuclear war, et cetera, et cetera. It was 1960. Slide, please. That's a larger 
image. It shows Ukraine and Russia, and then it begins to show Belarus on the top and on the left. You have the Black Sea, and you have Crimea, that smaller orange dot, and you can see that, uh, and, and Georgia, it's important, a lot of people don't know what Georgia, they, they never heard of Georgia. Well, Georgia is uh, kind of the, the bottom right, around you know, five o'clock, um, and that was also going to be part of NATO. Uh, and of course, when you put them all together, you would be surrounding Russia. So the whole idea of sphere of influence is a, is a big issue here. Uh, Russia is saying essentially, stay away from our borders. And um, uh, somehow, NATO has never been able to do that. Uh, slide, please. This is Ukraine into three ethnic areas. On the left, you've got the um, uh, Ukrainian-speaking area. And way on the left, you've got uh, the uh, Nazi areas. The other ones, way on the left, when you hear about those Ukrainians that killed our, well, those, <laughs> they, that's where they were from. And they're still there. They're still there. We'll, we're going to talk about them a little bit. Uh, and in the middle is the uh, area where they speak both languages. And uh, on the right, you've got the Russian-speaking areas that include Crimea. And on the top, you have Russia and then these other areas. Crimea is very important here. Uh, next, please. Um, how many bases, U.S. bases in the world? You got it. More like 780. 780 U.S. bases around the world. How many Russian bases are there? Three. How many Chinese bases are there? Two. You look it up. It's Wikipedia. You know, you can look it up. Um, essentially, the idea since World War II has been to surround the Soviet Union with military uh, bases. And of course, you know, well, that's the goal of the neocons uh, who have been uh, around since then. You see where China is, and you see that where we have some of the bases already down there. Next slide, please. This is, uh, this is, <laughs> this is great. This is William Burns. William Burns, anybody know who he is? No, 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 that's fine. Uh, 1994, he was ambassador uh, to Russia back then, and uh, he is now the director of the CIA, okay? And he's talking in 1994 about NATO expansion and provocation. There's that word, provocation. My thesis is that the West and the United States have always in provoked the, um, uh, the Soviet Union until the Soviet Union said, or Russia said, you know, that's enough. Uh, so he says, William Burns, uh, he's talking to one of these committees. You know, they're always kind of uh, having reports and, and updates, et cetera. He says, considering Russian President Yeltsin's views on Russia's sphere of influence, Yeltsin's statements in 1994 about NATO expansion, before extending office of formal NATO membership to Central European state, I recommend considering other forms of cooperation with former four Warsaw Pact members uh, in Russia. Um, he's saying, uh, don't, you know, there's other ways to, uh, to have security with these Warsaw Pacts. And, but in no November 1996, President Clinton, very important, uh, followed through on NATO expansion, uh, viewed by Russia as a stab in the back because Russia had been told for years that NATO would not move one inch east towards Russia. They'd been told this over and over again. It's in the literature, it's written up in, in foreign affairs magazines, et cetera, that, that we won't, we won't, well, we assure you we're not gonna go one inch. Unfortunately, it was never written down. And he concludes, Burns concludes, it seemed to me that NATO expansion was premature at best and needlessly Provocative at worst. Next slide. Ambassador uh, Jack Matlock, you really should look him up. Um, on 
YouTube, Ambassador Jack Mudlove, wonderful guy. He was the last ambassador to the USSR. Remember USSR fell apart, and then uh, Russia uh, was created, and all these countries uh, were incorporated little by little into NATO. In 1997, Jack Matloff, he testified before one of these committees, and he added about NATO and expansion, because remember, the United States controls everything. United States, there's no such thing as NATO without the United States. All these countries, they don't do anything without the approval of the United States, including Germany and France and the UK. They try to have a little independence, you know, they, they get self-conscious, but the United States and the United States plays hardball. The neocons play hardball. Um, and he's, his statement said, that means they will punish you if you don't do what they say. Uh, I consider the administration's recommendations to take new members into NATO, that was always the question, in, in, uh, having more Eastern countries into NATO, at this time misguided. A nice dramatic word. It's my guess. It may well go down in history as the most profound strategic blunder made since the end of the Cold War. Far from improving the security of the United States and its allies, I could well encourage, encourage a chain of events that could produce the most serious security threat to this nation since the Soviet Union collapse. Again, he's saying, don't move east. Next, please. So the neocons don't want to take over countries. They just want to take over the leadership of those countries. They want to create what's called regime change. How do you create re regime change? You have two, two methods. One, you have the economic road, uh, sanctions, right? You put the squeeze on them through sanctions. That is, you know, how many years have we had sanctions on Cuba, for example? We wonder why Cuba is... Uh, is so poor. We wonder why a lot of these people, countries have problems because we've put sanctions on them for a long time. And the other, the other way is, um, is uh, what's called military bleeding, or as one of our officers just said, he called it weakens. We want to weaken Russia. We don't want to destroy it. We don't want to occupy it. We just want to weaken them. You combine the, the weakness, military weakness, with the economy, uh, economic uh, stranglehold, you create unrest, maybe even civil war. And you bring in the CIA or you bring in Victoria Nuland into there and um, uh, you create regime change, which is what's been going on in Russia for quite a few years. You notice they've gone back and forth, et cetera, and the neocons have been there. That's Victoria Nuland. Um, and you create, now regime change, you create a regime that is pro-Western, or they call it a liberal hegemony, uh, and, uh, or, or what they call a democratic uh, regime, which means no regulation, pro-business, pro-US, that's what they mean by democratic. Next slide, please. Neocon movement, they're mostly interested in foreign policy, they're not interested in cultural issues or the, the woke issues or anything like that. They're into foreign policy and they've, they've written about that for many, many years. So in the 1970s, there was a group of uh, political scientists, they're all intellectuals, by the way. They're all, you know, uh, big universities, etc. cetera. Uh, and um, a group of these scientists, these leaders, including Donald Kagan, um, Norman Potteritz, people may know these names, Irving Crystal. Paul Wolfowitz was the main theoretician. Robert Kagan, he's the son of Donald, and uh, the wife of Robert, which is Victoria Newland, who's still around. She's still a, a young woman. Uh, by the way, if you notice that they're all Jewish names, that's because they're Jewish, right? So when you hear some of these anti-Semitism, well, uh, I won't say anything else about it, but uh, somehow there, there's a predominance of, of Jewish leadership and the main goal, the main message of the neocons is that U.S., it's all written down, U.S. must predominate in military power in every region of the world. They must confront regional powers that could challenge U.S. global or regional dominance, most importantly Russia and China. And U.S. military force 
to be repositioned in hundreds of military bases around the world, which explains the 800 bases, and U.S. should be prepared to lead wars as necessary to initiate a conflict. Um, some of the uh, leaders have been the ones mentioned, but we also, Dick Cheney, uh, Richard Pearl, all these people that brought us Vietnam and, and, and Iraq and, and uh, uh, Yemen, Syria, all, all these wars were, were led intellectually or theoretically by uh, these, uh, uh, these folks. This, and today, Anne uh, Applebaum, if you want to hear a neocon today, Anne, Anne Apple, uh, if, you, if you get uh, uh, the Atlantic magazine, you can read her stuff there. Next, please. This is um, uh, Victoria uh, uh, Newland in, in, uh, in action. Uh, on the left, there is a, a reporter that describes, or a journalist that dis describes her, um, uh, her, her, her history. He says, Victoria Newland has promoted a foreign policy of intervention whose proxy wars, aggression and occupation, uh, and that policy has been implemented in bloody and disastrous results in Afghanistan, Iraq, Iraq Libya, Syria, and Ukraine, and notice, none of these countries have what we would call democracy. They've failed. Their programs doesn't, doesn't have results in, in democracy any place. On the top left, Victoria, two weeks before one of these um, changeover in, um, in Ukraine, she showed up, Victoria Newland, with um, the ambassador at that time, and they were trying to figure out how to bring in their guy, again, regime change, and whether the UN would be involved or whether the EU would be involved. And Victoria Newland, there was an open mic, and she said, uh, essentially, it would be great to uh, help glue this thing uh, and to have uh, UN help glue it. And you know, fuck the, fuck the, union, uh, the EU. So she was caught on, on the mic, and of course, it was quite embarrassing. And the next day, she, you know, the EU was not pleased to hear the way they were talked about, and then the, the, the next day she had to apologize. But you see at the bottom, during this whole internal conflict they were having in Ukraine, you might call it a civil conflict, they've had quite a few, she was out there in the middle uh, giving out donuts and cookies and, and sandwiches, and this poor guy in back of her is probably the, the present ambassador of the time, but she's quite, uh, quite ho open about her views. Next one including Nord Stream. How many people are familiar with Nord Stream? Well, Nord Stream is uh, um, <laughs> it's a, it's a major project of giving uh, um, uh, Europe, Germany especially, uh, access to uh, gas from Russia that they've been getting for a long, long time and paying very minimal prices. But somehow, this, this pipeline, which is huge, was blown up. And people wondered when it was blown up. You didn't hear that in your media, right? Rachel Maddow didn't talk about this. This No, they're very, notice the media in this country, the reason we're so ignorant, polite word, the U.S. is very ignorant. We don't know anything. We're, you know, we've got the, we're still in 1950, most of us. Uh, is that our media doesn't tell us anything. The people, you have to really look hard and you go to other sources, maybe the BBC or some other places, uh, uh, to uh, to get this information. Uh, th so the pipeline was blown up, and everybody said, "Who would do such a thing? You really need to, you know, to." Well, <laughs> they told us. Biden said so. He had. He said publicly. He says if Russia invades, uh, they will no longer be Nord Stream Two. We'll bring an end an end to it. So the reporter said, to, what do you mean by that, sir? And, and Biden smiled, if you remember seeing him. And he said, don't worry about it. We have, we, have our, we have our ways. And at that time, Undersecretary Victor Newland stated, if Russia invades Ukraine one way or another, Nord Stream 2 will not move forward. So this is a way of punishing Russia right, by cutting off uh, the gas. But of course, it's cutting off heat to Germany. And did Germany say anything at the time? There were images of the, uh, the, the, the Prime Minister of Germany standing next to, next to Biden when he was making these statements, and the guy didn't say a word, right? So, of course, the Germans are pretty upset about this today, 
And uh, we have today uh, Seymour Hirsch, who's a very famous journalist. I think, I hope people remember him from Watergate and My Lai Massacre and uh, other, he's just written a book about uh, Seymour Hirsch, about um, who, who, who did it in great detail, great research, uh, and um, I'm not sure if uh, we've seen him on the media. He hasn't been on any of the media, has he? Have you seen Seymour Hirsch lately? Thank you. Um, so, Victor, so Biden, when it was done, they were very, very happy, and they were on the media. Um, Biden was very pleased, and Victoria Newland was interviewed by one of these committees just recently, uh, and I happened to see it somehow. Anybody see that interview where they asked her, Miss um, um, uh, Newland, how do you explain what happened to this pipeline? And she answered, uh, the, the administration is very gratified to know that Nord Stream 2 is now a hunk of metal at the bottom of the sea. And she was smiling, and the committee was smiling um, at that time. Uh, and Blinken stated that the pipeline is destruction provided, you know, this mysterious destruction provided a tremendous strategic opportunity for years to come. Uh, opportunity for whom? U U.S. business, maybe? You know, gas companies in the United States. So we haven't heard the end of that. Next, please. So we talk about denazification. The Russians demand a demilitarized border. They don't demand very much. Demilitarized border. Uh, Ukraine should not be part of NATO, which is a military alliance. And uh, denazify um, Ukraine. And we're all going, what do, you, what do you mean by that? What is Nazis over there? Well, yeah, they do have Nazis. They've had Nazis there for a long time. Those uh, people that joined the SS, if, I think some of you should maybe uh, ask if you've got all the, all the relatives. Maybe some of you remember that. But they were Ukrainian units fighting with the Nazis. Uh, and uh, they were led by a name, a gentleman, uh, Stefan Bandera. Simple name. You should look at him up. And he's considered a big, big hero. He's a nationalist, anti-Semite, um, anti-communist. Oh, they all have all these similar. And they're very proud of their, of, of their heritage and their lineage. And you notice they're, they're waving Nazi flags. Next, please. I should say something about these Ukrainians, because I used to live with them on the Lower East Side of New York, and, uh, which was a Ukrainian uh, community. And I would ask my, my uh, superintendent of the building, I would say, you know, my, my neighbors, uh, these, these older men, uh, they don't seem to come out very much. They don't, they, you don't see them very often. How do you explain that? And she says, oh, that's because they were, they were Ukrainian uh, and they, they fought with the Nazis and they're afraid to go out and to be recognized by anybody in the street. That's why they, they hide out. Next, please. Putin's goal in the invasion. I'm gonna try to make it quick. Um, it was very limited. We remember, like, w w what's going on? It's not, not very much of an invasion. So the, um, the academic John Mersheimer should find his lectures as well. He stated, the U.S. and U.K. were baffled by the R Russian offensive. We assumed uh, they would invade a country the way we would have invaded a country, destroying communication, transportation, energy system, etc. To the surprise of the U.S. and U.K. planners, Putin didn't do that. Press reports that in Kyiv, in much of the western part of the country, pre-war life had largely returned for civilians. Putin was holding back. Why? Well, he thought that a small initial uh, invasion would lead to the negotiating table. Now, we, 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 we haven't heard about any negotiations, right? Until just recently, if we're paying attention. And he was right, because, and this is where Israel comes in, Prime Minister Bennett of Israel has just publicly talked about that in the last few weeks, and he said that he arranged for negotiations that went on a couple of weeks after the invasion. This is what he says. Um, well, this is, this is what I, I gather, put together. Uh, negotiations were weakened, there's that word again, uh, would weaken, no ne negotiated, the, the goal is to weaken Russia, excuse me. According to U.S. official and now Prime Minister Bennett of Israel, now why was Bennett involved? And he said, because he said, our U Israeli aircraft are over Syria. And if we 
if if we have a real problem with the Russians, the Russians are going to push the button and, 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 and destroy our military, our air force over Syria. And that's why we're, I would like to have a peace deal. Uh, there's a lot that's been written about. Um, Prime Minister Bell, in April 2022, last year, April, February, April, right? Uh, Russian and Ukrainian negotiators agreed on a negotiated settlement. The terms were for Russia to withdraw to the position it held before launching the invasion on February 24, 22. In exchange, Ukraine promised not to seek NATO membership and instead receive security guarantees. Everybody wants security guarantees. But Prime Minister Boris Johnson, I don't know if anybody remembers that, uh, at once flew to Kiev with the message that Ukraine's Western backers would not support the diplomatic initiative. That's been in the news. It kind of came and went. Did Rachel tell us about that? No, 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 she did. The only thing I heard Rachel say lately is there was a peace demonstration in Washington. She made fun of it. She made fun of it, if you remember. That's Rachel Maddow today. The media today has been bought off. It has, it's not the media that it was many years ago. So uh, the, uh, the Prime Minister Boris uh, Johnson shows up in Kiev with a message that Western backers would not support, that means the United States, and money and weapons support the diplomatic initiative. Later, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin stated the official U.S. position on, on negotiation. He said Washington's goal in the war is to weaken Russia, meaning that no negotiations and negotiations are off the table. That's re re regime change. Next, please. Expansion and um, containment. I'll make it short. If, um, if, if, uh, if Russia uh, gets in, um, if NATO, excuse me, if Georgia and Ukraine gets in, you get five NATO countries surrounding, uh, surrounding Bla uh, uh, Russia. It's like, just think of it this way. If uh, Canada, and uh, Mexico and Cuba had foreign troops or missiles in there. How would, remember Cuba? How happy would we be? By the way, there's a story that's told in World War I, the Russians, uh, excuse me, the Germans in World War I uh, tried to have some uh, uh, basis or influence uh, with Mexico. And the United States got very, very upset. Um, Jack Matloff talks about that. Next, please. More on sphere of influence, self-determination. This is pretty funny. The uh, Secretary General uh, of um, NATO makes a statement. He says, it's only Ukraine in NATO that decide when Ukraine is ready to join NATO. Russia has no right to establish a sphere of influence to try to control their neighbors, a sphere of influence idea. And he hasn't heard about uh, the Monroe Doctrine where we say essentially that we want have absolute control over North America, Central America, South America, or Canada. We want to have control. Remember Cuba again? Next, please. Again, U.S. Ambassador Jack Matloff, who in 20, 2022, just last year, in May, he said, what President Putin is demanding, which is an end to NATO expansion and creation of a security structure in Europe, that ensures Russia's security, along with that of others, is eminently reasonable. He's not demanding the exit of any NATO members, and he's not threatening none. So the goal is security. This, uh, you're going to accuse him of being anti-American. Next, please. But now we have nuclear war. And uh, the, uh, uh, I'll make it short. Essentially, you've got Article 5. Uh, you can look it up in the NATO uh, uh, treaties, which says essentially an attack on one is an attack on everybody. That's why Russia says that it's fighting Europe with the United States. Uh, it's a proxy war, actually, between, um, between Russia and, um, uh, uh, and the United States uh, 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 with, without any U.S. troops, but a, a war to the last Ukrainian. You've heard that expression. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna fight Russia to the last Ukrainian. Next, please. Pope Francis. Pope Francis 
made a statement not too long ago. He also said, he said obviously it was a very limited invasion from what I can see. He also said that we do not see the whole drama unfolding behind this war, which was perhaps somehow either provoked or not prevented. This is the Pope. Uh, one more point, my time is up, but the idea of global support, when, when you hear Biden saying um, uh, the world supports us uh, against, uh, um, you, uh, uh, against Russia and Russia is isolated, it's just the opposite. The world, which is not white, uh, the world that has been colonized for many, many centuries by white Europeans, does not support the United States. They've done surveys, 85% support the Russian position. Next, please. Thank you. I loaded the slide, so I knew when your last slide was. All right, thank you, Renee. So now we're going to hear a different perspective by our guest and second speaker, Frederick Pearson. He is professor of political science, former director of the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies at Wayne State University. Dr. Pearson received his PhD, University of Michigan. He is a recognized authority in the fields of international military intervention, arms transfer effects on wars, civil and international conflict analysis. He has twice been senior Fulbright research professor the Netherlands. Wayne State University, he has been recognized as Gershenson Distinguished Research Professor and as Graduate Mentor of the Year. He's the author and co-author of several books, including, and you'll see how these are re relevant, Arms and Warfare, Escalation, De-Escalation, The Global Spread of Arms, The Political Economy of International Security, Arms and Ethnic Warfare, sorry, it's a different book, Arms and Ethnic Warfare, The Causes and Solutions to Civil Wars, and Arab Approaches to Conflict Resolution, Mediation, Negotiation, and the Settlement of Political Disputes. Dr. Pearson has developed programs for resolving community disputes involving ethnic and immigrant relations, he served as director of the Detroit Council for World Affairs. He is also past president of the Rotary Club of Detroit, he serves on the advisory board, Michigan Coalition uh, for Human Rights. And it's my pleasure to welcome now, with a differing opinion, Dr. Frederick Pearson. Thanks, Rabbi. It's a pleasure to be at the temple here um, um, where I was introduced to this place by my friend and neighbor, Ed Shalom, a number of years ago, and uh, where my predecessor, Lillian Genser, had a special relationship with Rabbi Wine. I think she claimed him as her camp counselee. Uh, I don't know if that could be true or not, but I think. Um, thank you to hear Rene. Uh, I have a great deal of respect for his viewpoints. Uh, the things he raises do have some validity and so forth. I would defend Rachel Maddow, by the way, if you haven't heard her ultra podcast, I would strongly commend it to you. She's an unusually thorough researcher for a TV commentator. And the expose of the extent of Father Coughlin's crimes is even greater than I ever realized. I never knew he had a armed militia uh, dedicated, the Christian front dedicated to overthrowing the government. Yes. Are you having trouble hearing me too? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, can you not hear in the back? Okay. Oh, it's right here. Well, I was sort of defending Rachel Maddow and commending to you to listen to her ultra podcast of eight episodes about neo-Nazism in the United States, 30s and 40s, which was very real, has a great similarity to some things that are going on now as well as the expose of Father Coughlin's extensive efforts to overthrow the U.S. government, which were, I think, unappreciated in this community. We knew how bad he was on the radio. We didn't know how much organiz organizing he did to overthrow the government. Um, in, in response to some of the points that uh, Rene has made, I certainly am no defender of the extension of NATO. It was a strategic error on the part of the United States. Uh, I think that it was due in large part to hubris and the sense that the Cold War was over. And they even invited Russia, at least uh, in, in, uh, rhetorically, to join. 
because I think they thought it wouldn't be a big deal. Now, the countries of Eastern Europe evidently thought it was a big deal to have protection against a potential Russian uh, reversion again in, into Eastern Europe, but we have to understand something important here. There are two reasons for backing this effort to uphold Ukraine, in my opinion. One is the notion of global order, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, you can call it neocon. I, preserve, I, pre I prefer to call it uh, liberalist, going back to the First World War, end of the First World War, and Woodrow Wilson's creation of the League of Nations. Um, and then beyond that to Franklin Roosevelt and the UN. There is a neocon aspect to U.S. policy and, a, uh, and, and uh, you know, efforts in the world certainly have been uh, not without criticism. Iraq War, Vietnam War, uh, a number of situations uh, trying to overthrow governments, Chile, and so on and so forth. Um, but at the same time, there is a remarkable and important effort to establish a principle world politics, that you don't take over other countries by force. You don't absorb them, you don't take them over. This was one of the, pre uh, the, uh, the principles of the League of Nations collective security plank, which unfortunately I think Wilson was, you know, sort of used by Clemenceau in France to stick it to Germany, basically, and create a bunch of countries on Germany's other side, calling it self-determination, and so on and so forth, to balance off when Soviet, when the Russia became the Soviet Union and left the war, leaving Germany facing France head on. Um, so there were different motives for this, but the principle that there's something called collective security, which is that countries should come to the rescue of a country that's being taken over. And now it doesn't work often all that well because countries that try to take over countries generally are not friendless. They generally have partners and coalition, coalitions and trade partners. We see that with Russia. Russia is not friendless. They're not isolated uh, in the world. China cozies up to a certain degree. India cozies up to a certain degree, even though they stand for the principle of the UN, which is you're not supposed to take over countries. They don't want to be taken over. India is fighting off China on the border right now uh, in a complicated situation. That's why they need Russian arms, and that's one of the reasons they need Russian oil. So it stands in the way of backing up the principle, but the principle is very important. We see it, we see it observed in certain isolated cases. <laughs> the country Kuwait exists, for better or worse, because of the war fought against Saddam Hussein. Not the Iraq War, but the Gulf War of the 90s to get Iraq out of Kuwait. Saddam claimed it as his 18th province, claimed it was uh, drilling oil horizontally under Iraq, therefore could take it over. Um, the effort of a number of countries, a large coalition of countries, to back him off, get him out of there, not because they like Kuwait particularly, it's not a very enlightened emirate, it's, it's quite rich and so on and so forth, it has to have oil, um, but because the principle stood, if, the, if countries can go under, you're, you could be next. And if there's nobody to rescue, then there's a problem in world, world order, so to speak. Now, the other irony I want to point out is that Vladimir Putin, who talks all the time about getting after the neo-Nazis in Western Ukraine and, and, and opposing uh, anti-Semitism and so on and so forth, uh, Putin ironically uses the exact same techniques as Hitler. Now he has he had a he had a uh, you know he had some uh, concern he had some grievance about NATO Hitler had some grievance about Versailles the Versailles Treaty to completely victimize Germany and set it up for the rise of a guy like Hitler who could play to the grievances and the destitution of a country that went through massive inflation because of the um, um, reparations that were forced on them by France, and then follow that with the Great Depression, you set it up for the inevitable rise of the Nazis. Blame it on the Jews and get, and get it going through military conquest. Now, Putin presides over a country that, you know, and he can talk about grievances of the NATO expansion efforts and all that, 
This is a country that was on its knees at the end of the Cold War. We visited, my wife and I, and we saw people laying in the streets in Moscow waiting for ambulances that didn't come because the medical system was totally uh, destroyed. No one was getting paid. People were selling their clothes on the street, literally on racks in the corner to try to get some income. The life expectancy in Russia went from, uh, I don't know, 70-something to 50-something because of the complete dislocation. We had to start paying their nuclear scientists because we were afraid that they'd start selling off nuclear weapons to God knows who, God knows where. And that continued up until uh, recent times when Putin said stop. Uh, so it was almost inevitable that a guy would come along not wearing a red hat but saying he wanted to make Russia great again. And that's what Putin has done. He's in league with some of the most repressive parts of the Russian political system. Uh, I can think of the Orthodox Church in Russia as one of the most re regressive. And he's made his case with those people to assume great power and to bring the Russian Empire, if you will, back. It's a great achievement for somebody to convince Sweden and Finland to join NATO. Who would have thunk? that the two, two of the most persistent and expert countries at neutrality would feel so, in, uh, so endangered that they would be re ready to join NATO of their own volition. And of course, Turkey's keep them, keeping them out because they're too friendly to the Kurds. So we have uh, Putin succeeding at that, uh, at, at, at driving that kind of wedge. And the techniques he's used, reminiscent of Hitler, I want to reunite the language group. Hitler, of course, did that with the Sudeten Germans, making his excuse for invading uh, Czechoslovakia, and of course the British signed off on it and allowed him to do it, saying, okay, as long as you don't take any other, as long as nothing else, go ahead, take the Sudeten. Well, of course he didn't stop. I'm not saying that Putin won't stop, some people do, but I'm saying that that is a technique that is reminiscent of Hitler. Uh, and, uh, and so is the, uh, you know, the, the subversion of Ukraine. I would recommend to Rene that he look at, uh, for, for a good media presentation, PBS, because they presented in the Frontline series a great program called The Battle of Ukraine in, in 2014, which shows some of the neo-Nazis, the Bandera group, but it also shows the group called Stronghold, in the eastern part of the country, the Russian-speaking part of the country, if you will. And um, that shows equal brutality and mayhem by a militia that was out to fight Western militia called, called uh, um, Right Sector. And the courageous journalists visited both parties and saw these thugs ready to uh, go at each other. And they did go at each other, shooting into government buildings and killing wantonly shopping malls in the East. They said that Putin's people, the, uh, the intelligence agents, were there paying $40 an hour for them to rise and, and oppose the Western part of Ukraine. He was subverting the country, of course, because he was seeing too much flirting with the EU by the Ukrainian uh, regime. And they backed off of that and caused the Maidan revolution and the guy fled to Moscow. Uh, to get out of the way of the shooting of the protesters. Um, so, you know, the, um, this is not an easy black and white picture. But what's important here is that you stand up for something in this case, uh, and that you try to rally a coalition to stand up for collective security of a country like Ukraine. Ukraine was recognized by Russia as independent in 1994. Rene talks about Yeltsin and how upset he was about NATO and so on. Yeltsin signed the document that, re, that re recognized Ukrainian independence in return for the return for the nuclear weapons that were stationed there. They would be returned to Russia. And Russia would get a lease, perpetual lease, I think, on the uh, Sevastopol naval base in uh, Crimea. So Russia was not being excluded from Ukraine. They were getting a permanent base, as they always have had, on the Black Sea. It's been called the Russian Lake. Um, and of course, uh, you can look at the Battleship Potemkin movie and book to get a picture of how that worked under the Tsar. But, uh, but uh, uh, they would have had access to, to the Crimea. 
um, where Stalin, by the way, forced the population in and out and changed the whole nature of the population. There are, from us Wayne Staters, we are happy to say that there are Tartars living in, in, in Crimea. They were forced into there. By the way, uh, they should be called Tatars. And that's one of the reasons Wayne changed its uh, nickname, I think, because no one knows what Tartar is. It thought it was tooth decay or a fish sauce. Anyway, in honor of the Tatars, I just thought I'd point out that it was not a completely Russian-speaking population. And there was a very uh, uh, un un unethical plebiscite that was held there. We really need a UN plebiscite there to figure out who wants to be part of what. Now, I'm not opposed to a, 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 a negotiated solution. In fact, there was, in the outline that Rene gave, uh, the Minsk Agreement was formed in 2015, I believe, shortly after uh, the invasion of Crimea and the events of the uh, TV, TV depiction in, about the Maidan Revolution. Um, and the Minsk Agreement, I think, had some merit. Unfortunately, I don't think the Ukrainian government at that time lived up to it. They wanted to keep the East. And the agreement essentially said that the East would have certain autonomy, uh, local autonomy, uh, for the Russian, more Russian-oriented people. There were people there who were dependent on the Russian economy because the Ukraine economy, like the Russian economy, is corrupt, was corrupt at that time. And it wasn't reaching the East very effectively. And this is before Zelensky now, talking about previous generations. And um, so there, it made sense. It was, it, was, it was negotiated at the OSCE, the Organization of Security and Cooperation in Europe, which was a detente uh, agreement from the 1960s and 70s to establish a European organization, East and West, to try to settle disputes. People often overlook that that organization exists, and it's a, very, it's a very useful tool. So they came up with that agreement in Minsk, and it, it wasn't fully implemented. There wasn't enough autonomy. They were still shooting at each other. There wasn't the ceasefire that was between these militias. So unfortunately, it's a messy situation in Ukraine, but it didn't merit what, what, Yelt, what, uh, sorry, what uh, Putin has done, which is to pair up the agreement essentially, that there should be an independent Ukraine. He has said as much that you know, Ukraine is uh, virtually Russia. And of course, there is a history about that. The Russian uh, state originated under the czars in something called Kievan Rus. Kievan Rus, which is Kiev, when Moscow was a field of nothing, essentially. And they have harbored the, uh, the, uh, the incorporation of this country into the Russian Empire uh, various times. Who, uh, Ukraine and Poland are in a bad neighborhood. Let's face it. They're both faced on one side by essentially the German influence and on the other side by the Russian influence. They've been on the map and they've been off the map at various times of history. But they're on the map now. They're a UN member. And if you allow that country to be obliterated as a UN member, You've undercut the UN and the substance of what it's supposed to stand for under international law. Now, I heard the flippant remark that Joe Biden's a war criminal, but I think that we've got a bigger one uh, on the eastern side of this. Uh, somebody who has wantonly, I don't know whether Joe Biden wantonly destroyed a, a family in Afghanistan, if that's one of the crimes. But this guy has wantonly destroyed families and buildings and civilian uh, uh, centers, and, and essentially almost a nuclear plant. Uh, and he's under indictment, I guess, and that's a, wild, that's a growing thing. Um, he's under indictment for uh, so, supposedly kidnapping children, the Ukrainian children, and taking them forcefully to uh, Russia. But at any rate, I think that in the future there will be, there has to be some sort of negotiated approach here. But you have to stand up to this thing first. And I think that actually the West and the, and the, and the coalition has done a pretty good job of being re restrained enough not to provoke a nuclear attack at this point. Let's hope that, that re, uh, you know, remains. But they have you know, provided a wherewithal to resist. The Finnish, Finland resisted Russia in 1940 when it invaded under Stalin to try to get uh, you know, buffering area against the rising tide of German power. 
and they resisted for a couple of weeks, but they didn't have the international support that Ukraine has had. And yes, there has been deviations from it. The Israelis have not been in, in, in on it. The, you, the Indians have not been supportive of the anti-Russian sanctions. The Chinese sort of walk a, a tightrope, in a sense, because they need Europe as well as Russia. China's largest trading partner, I think, is the EU. So they can't quite uh, you know, dismiss the, the concerns and the claims of a European war. The African states, some of them do consider it a European war, and why, do, why should we mess with it? It's not ours, it's the Western war. But others have uh, been concerned because the same principle applies in Africa. You're supposed to leave each other alone. You're supposed to not take over your neighboring country, especially when you've recognized it in an agreement, or the agreement up. Um, Hitler did that, and Stalin did that, but Hitler tore up his agreement with Stalin in 1941. Uh, it had the non-aggression pact agreement uh, to leave each other alone and to split Poland and then go after England in the case of, uh, of Germany, but they can beat the British, so they, can, they turn to, the, to invade Russia. Tore up that agreement, just as Putin has torn up an agreement to uh, recognize the independence of Ukraine. There are other states that matter here. Georgia, as was pointed out, 2008, flirted with NATO, and Bush, unfortunately, flirted back. I'm not even sure where Georgia was, if it wasn't. It wasn't Atlanta, uh, but uh, the Russians uh, adopted the technique, Putin adopted the technique that he later used in Ukraine, which is invade the country, call it peacekeeping, take over the northern part of Georgia, protect the Abkhazians, the minority group who exist in Russia and in Georgia, as an excuse to uh, essentially take over Georgia. That was a forewarning. That was a for, uh, you know, um, early indication of what he would do if he thought NATO might get too pushy. And a country that, again, was recognized as independent when Gorbachev and Yeltsin allowed the memberment, so to speak, of the Soviet Union and Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia. You, you can understand why these countries wanted to join NATO, some of them, because they, you know, they're worried that they might get taken back. And they do have Russian-speaking populations, which they were very brutal about in some cases. The uh, Lithuanians and the Latvians not very uh, warm toward the Russians when they became independent to, give, to pay back for the pri prior domination that the Russians had had in those countries. So this was a complicated empire which was allowed to dismember by Gorbachev, who wanted a different approach Quit wasting all this money on this Cold War and try to modernize the country so we got something to sell besides oil, gas. Maybe a Russian car somebody might want, maybe a Russian refrigerator somebody might want to buy, you know. Unfortunately, Russia's been called a gas station uh, with an army, right? Is that what? Oh. Uh, so uh, instead of modernizing the country and creating a greater technological capability, uh, uh, um, Putin has chosen to go the geopolitical route and uh, invade. And I don't think it was expected that he would do it, except that Biden kept warning us for several months in advance that our intelligence was indicated he would do it. And it wouldn't just be a, a show uh, in the, you know, effort. I think it was the, the, in, the assumption in Moscow that they could walk over, easily walk over Ukraine. And it hasn't been an easy time. By the way, I don't have the same sense that Taiwan quite deserves as much protection. The reason for that is they're not a recognized The United States doesn't recognize them. We made that deal under Nixon to get China, the opera Nixon in China, that we said. If you haven't seen it, it's playing again in Paris. Uh, when uh, Kissinger decided we wanted to cozy up to Mao to offset the Russians, we, we felt that the Taiwanese no longer should be treated as if they represent China. And we dis, we dis uh, um, recon, unrecognized them, but we gave them a security treaty where we have pledged to defend them. This is quite a weird arrangement we have with Taiwan. They're not a UN member, they're an observer state, uh, so, but they're not the same status as Ukraine. 
for better or worse you made ukraine independent you're stuck with it let's make it work uh, and and survive as its condition because that's the way we do the international order if we're going to have any so that would be the point i would make thank you very much R Renee, we don't have a lot of time, so come on up. Does anybody have questions for one or the other? Um, who's your question for, David? Is it for Brad? Okay. All right, so while, Renee, while you're coming up, Fred can... By the way, I want to give you another historical artifact, if I could real quickly. Not many of us remember that on December 6, 1941, Japanese envoys were in the White House negotiating with Franklin Roosevelt the night before Pearl Harbor. And on the table, again, like a plan, you know, an offer, was the offer to the U.S. that if we would um, back off hostilities with Japan and allow them to get oil and things we were boycotting, they would agree to pull out of Southeast Asia, leave the Philippines alone on one condition that they be allowed to stay in China, essentially control China. And Roosevelt thought hard because we knew there would be an attack the morning of December 7th. It had broken the naval code. We just didn't know where. They thought it was going to be the Philippines. They thought, it, you know, a number of places. No one thought it would be Pearl Harbor where all of our ships are. Are you kidding? They're going to attack <laughs> our strongest. But that's what they were trying to do. And he uh, decided, no, I can't agree to that can't agree to let you have China. I'm not sure Xi Jinping realizes the United States fought the Second World War in the Pacific to preserve China. Uh, the, the reason, of course, is the U.S. is China stuck on the notion that we shouldn't allow any one country to dominate a region completely, unless it's us. <laughs> uh, so, go ahead. Waste. Of course, yeah. Putin has never said that Russia, uh, uh, that, that, that Ukraine uh, doesn't exist. The demands were very clear. The demands were very clear all throughout, which is that demilitarize uh, Ukraine on our borders, just the way we say Cuba, no missiles, and number two, get rid of the Nazis. That's all. He said the country can be whatever it wants. He had no, no illusions about invading a whole country. So this idea, you start out with, with, with a lie that he wants to take over the whole country, and then, of course, you could say, well, of course they have a right to self-determination. Let me say something about self-determination, which is an abstract you know, principle. But you have to look in your neighborhood when you're going to implement this principle of self-determination. In the United States, of course, Cuba doesn't have self-determination. Central America, uh, Canada, if Canada is going to invite China to be there, you're going to say they have a right to self-determination? No, it would be foolish on their part, and it's foolish on the part of Ukraine to be a part of a military alliance which would put weapons right on the border. And all he's saying is, we don't want no, no weapons on our border. Any country would say that. So in pra you have to look at the practice of this concept of uh, self-determination. Quickly, uh, Americans don't quite realize the Cuban Missile Crisis ended in a negotiated agreement with Russia. 
we thought we, we think that we faced off Russia and forced them out. Actually, there's an agreement that we will not invade Cuba. That was the trade-off that we made with the Russians at the end, of the, but it was kept secret because we didn't want to admit that we were going to give any concession. No invasion of Cuba was one, one thing, and um, missiles withdrawn from Turkey in, in, uh, in agreement as well. They were going to be withdrawn anyway, and Kennedy was furious. So it's a little more complicated than that, but I do think we should stop the, the sanctioning of Cuba. It's ridiculous. They could, why are they driving 54 Chevys? I mean, it's ridiculous. Look at our relationship with Vietnam and the, the amount of cooperation we're doing with Vietnam and trade, and they're a communist state. And the China is a major trade partner. It's a communist state. So there's no reason other than politics in Florida or wherever else it might be that we're still doing this with Cuba. But uh, uh, yes, I agree that, that uh, the survival of, of Ukraine as a state is, is in the, na the international interest, shall we say, that this should not be allowed to happen. If you don't like something, negotiate about it. And I think that the neg negotiating terms can be derived that Ukraine would agree, hopefully, not to try to join NATO, given the right security guarantee. Because I don't think that NATO should pull up ex further to the east than it already is. Now we're here. <laughs> Ask him to come back up. I want to both of our speakers. Very interesting uh, uh, discussion. Thank you so much. <laughs> and we will uh, uh, be in peaceful and stuff. <laughs> an aspirational song, obviously. <laughs> and strong is that we have each other one human family across the land <laughs> Once again, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to Joseph, as usual, to David Weeks, who does our streaming, to Arthur, who runs the slides. To all of you, Shabbat Shalom. Join us for our own egg.